where on where on Dublin? Right off of Powers? No, 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 no. no. I'm just off of Academy. Which okay, is you're right. when you were saying about putting a constitution in, and instead you should let it concentrate up. Dublin is four blocks right. from Woodland. Right. What was the point? <laughs> you wonder sometimes. I wondered always. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, I did not communicate to the right people at the right time. So now I'm on fire. So to who? Awesome. Uh, okay, Kay That's Crager. Kay Crager at Spring mm -hmm. Job. Okay. And then, or Larry Bagley. And you then, know? Nancy, the other thing you, you were going to talk about, I think you wanted to ask Brandy about last time, was how do you get the unorganized neighborhood to get involved with this sort of thing? And that's where Kono would like to be very helpful. We okay. are actually had a meeting last night with, with folks who are concerned about the development of the Bates School into a multi-story um, student housing project for ECCS students. And they haven't been organized in a long time. And we're helping them reorganize. We're helping another, another group over on Campus Commons, which is north of that, north of the Bates School. And, there's a development that's going to be uh, put in on top of the bridge between those two that the campus commons people are concerned about. They've never had a neighborhood organization, but we're helping them organize. So, so we, I, you mentioned that yesterday, and there was no way I could come to your meeting to kind of see what happened. So where would I begin? <laughs> why, don't you, why don't you find four or five people, or fewer, if neighbors. you have to. Neighbors. Two. And call a meeting. and. One or more of us will come and help you with me. I can do that. I know you can. <laughs> <laughs> if I don't have rehearsals from now on until That's September. right. You've got a lot of time. <laughs> and that's how it started. I sing with his daughter, sing room. Dad, don't We've need been a lot busy. Of folks. <laughs> I'm sorry? We don't need a lot of folks because we, uh, Kono, ended up organizing a group down in the uh, Fountain area. And there were a total of six people in the whole neighborhood. And they organized. And so you don't need a big number. You just need some enthusiastic and dedicated. Okay. That's coming back to haunt me too, you know. <laughs> now I've now I've got a call from the from Juan Flores, who is the I'm sorry. From no, Juan no. Flores, who's the code enforcement officer for Fountain, wanting me to come to Vail in the summer to talk to the state organization of code enforcement officers about how you get neighborhoods to be involved in code enforcement. So it, it's, Oh, that sounds like a tough Tough duty. Yeah. 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 So yeah. 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 I would like to know that the answer to that. Uh, we'll, so we'll talk know, about that another person. time. Okay. Good. Okay. <coughs> oh, ice cream. Sorry, I should no. have told you. No, no, I didn't know if somebody behind yeah. me was. No. Nope. I just have a question. If a neighborhood has an issue, you know, and we're, and we're working with it, we do have an HOA and, and some, some support. Um, but we see it as something that might need to be dealt with citywide. Do we, with the new new mate, the strong mayor, where do we go first? What do we do? I'm not getting the impression that council works with the mayor, and hopefully that maybe that will change. <laughs> that will change. I think it's but <laughs> where does the community? Where do you, you go? start for Kono? You start with Kono because Kono has a very robust code enforcement and. Um, everything presence. So I'd start with these guys because then they can help you get to the right city staff folks. I'm so happy to hear it's going to change. It just makes me spin. You know, one of the, one of the uh, interesting things about Dublin is that there was another east-west corridor that was cut off by UCCS. That was Montebello. And I honestly think that they probably wouldn't have made the connection to Dublin had Montebello gone through all the way to Nevada, which is what it was originally planned. And then UCCS got a piece of property in between there, and Dublin, that ain't happening. Okay. And, uh, and so they, that, that whole thing got cut off. So that was another corridor that had that gone through, Dublin may not have gotten connected. So those are the kinds of, uh, you know, dominoes that fall yeah, yeah, uh, as yeah. different things happen over, over time. And, and that happens in a lot of communities, either the geography, geology, um, political power, whatever. That, that happens a lot. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm just happy that what we were part of actually involved real data. It wasn't just, we actually kind of made a mistake at one point. We lobbied council so hard we got them to take us out of the east-west study. <laughs> and then we thought, wait a minute, that wasn't a good idea. And we had the chamber and everybody breathing down our necks, so then we had to lobby them to undo that. <laughs> there are still people that talk about that constitution you were talking about. Yeah. That. I, there, I've been Say a former employer. Oh gosh, members. yeah. And they remember, and, and when they talk about that, they think that was the demise of Colorado Springs. Oh, that well. That <laughs> got a question. Yeah, not to change the subject, but uh, since we have a couple of people here that, that have served on the city council, what what's your take on compensation? Big subject. Well, I, you want to go first? I, you can go first. Okay. Here's your time to think. I answered yesterday, but I'll see if I'll change my answer. <laughs> Um, I think that when I was serving, um, I didn't think it was enough. And in a completely abstract world, I think it's laughable that you would have your elected representatives make as little, um, not even minimum wage. Um, it, it caused me to have to have another full-time job. It caused me to take away from our family life, which Frankly, my kids are both leaders in their own right, so I can't say that they suffer one bit. But so in a completely abstract sense, isolated from other considerations, it's not enough. It's ridiculous. But what I've watched and observed over the years is high compensation doesn't necessarily bring you good elected officials. So in the end, the value of the pay being low is that people don't run for that seat unless they generally don't run for that seat unless they really care and they really think they can make a difference. There are climbers, and our former the woman who represented our district was a climber, and that's all she wanted. Um, and there are those, but generally with such a low compensation rate, you generally end up with people who are more committed to the community and less interested in being career politicians. That being said, should it be 12,000, like Pueblo, Pueblo's is 12,000 Ours is six. Uh, should it be more? Yeah. Should it be a professional 80, 90,000? I don't think so. That's, that's just the What'd you say? Right, same thing. It's laughable how much we pay people. By the time I put in all the hours, I earn about $2 an hour, which is if that. ridiculous. But I didn't get any tips. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that would have been at fun. At a restaurant or something, you could get your tips at the end of the night. We didn't get any tips. So I, 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 think, I think Margaret's right. Somewhere between, there's there's no direct correlation between a hundred thousand dollar wage and the person you're going to get. But if you have a wage that people can live on, right. you get a wider variety of people who will at least look at that as a way to serve their community because it's very hard to do it for. And they'll get to spend more time doing it. Yeah. I literally had to work because I was a freelancer and could not do my city business. My business my business and my city office. I was never in my city office. I worked in my council position and my job at home because I could never, you would never want to spend city assets and city office to pursue your own business. You can't do it. So as a result, I wasn't in my office much. I don't think it hurt much, but I could certainly have been more active in the community if I'd been but, paid more. But having experienced that Margaret was always accessible, I didn't. I was not one of her constituents, but every time I called, I got an answer. Um, and to watch your posture. <laughs> and, attack, yeah. and Mrs. Lolly had the question, and then, oh, then no. I okay. think we'll stop unless you want to keep going. I'm good. Okay, I was just going to comment on what you said, and just for the record, I'll let you know that John does believe city council pay does need to increase. And, um, I don't know when that could happen. I guess it has to take a grassroots effort from people, but he definitely agrees with that. And then the other question I had is, you know, where you talked about the UCCA's Bates Hall, and I know about the Broadmoor Skyway neighborhood concerned about what the equestrian center is. What other issues are bubbling up in other or neighborhood organizations that, that we should be paying attention to? It depends on the neighborhood organization. We've got some representatives here, but, you know, the southeast 
South Central, really, of the city is, is really sadly neglected, and it's neglected institutionally. Um, and we are just, I think we are just now as Kono understanding that we have this institutional problem. Because all of the north part of the city, especially the northwest, but also the northeast, is sort of self-protected. All the development that's gone on, would you like to comment on this? No, 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 what you mean? All the development that's gone on is pretty much because of special improvement districts. So the developers who are building that have, in order to be able to construct the infrastructure that they've constructed without costing the city the money, they've been allowed to have these special metropolitan improvement districts. And Kevin, am I speaking correctly? So far. Good. You, you will correct me if I, I, will. If I make a mistake. I had somebody come to me yesterday to say, you're wrong about this. No, I'm not. Anyway, so the, we have these special metropolitan improvement districts that allow for addition, essentially additional taxation. And that allows these new developments to take place and be, be paid for. The rest of the city, and that includes my neighborhood, the Old North End and Patty Jewett and everybody south, basically, doesn't have that. And one of the things that I think we have to figure out is before too much longer is how do we rectify that or we will have a city of haves mm -hmm. and have nots. That's right. We already kind of do. We really kind of do. One of the things I suggested to the current mayor when I did, when I was, uh, no, nobody else was on that body but me <laughs> here, and when I was in charge of his first uh, solutions team was that we develop a, uh, we develop a, uh, we had a little confrontation with that at one point, didn't we? Well, that's because I thought they were a complete waste of your time. But. It turned out to be so, yeah. uh, pretty much. But, um, a judge of character. <laughs> uh, but one of the things I suggested was that we think about using city attorneys to help neighborhoods that are interested in developing their own metropolitan improvement districts. And I think we have got a couple. They're not, I don't think that's going to happen in the southeast, Doug. Maybe you do, but I think places like the Old North End and Patty Jewett, maybe Ivy Wild, would be have enough momentum right now to say, yeah, if we had the legal assistance to make that happen, we'd be interested in forming our own metropolitan improvement district, taxing ourselves to make sure our infrastructure is, is better off. That's it, but that's just a that's a small step toward trying to rectify what is a big, big problem. I, I think there's another thing too that one of the reasons I, well, the reason I was late coming here is because we were just having a meeting with city staff on uh, public input and how it has almost disappeared in the last few years. And that one of the, the goals that you're going to get, we need to get that, is that uh, public process of what's going on in your neighborhood. And uh, we were meeting with uh, Peter Wasatsky. Wasatsky. And who has introduced <coughs> and explained to him our concern about it because so much of it's going to administrative uh, relief and it's never even addressed by the neighbors. That's what's happened out in Craigmore. That was all administrative. And so the public process is being taken out of it. And this could be a challenge for John because the development community is making this happen mm -hmm. as it was before. Well, I, I honestly think, at least in our conversations on the infill steering committee, that there's a split in the development community. Oh, too. good. And I think that the better, the better, the more high quality, high quality, uh, more what mm -hmm. prosperous is probably the best term of our development, our developers understand for the most part that the public process is good for them and the less successful ones don't feel that way. They well, see it as just an uh, uh, impasse or a uh, impasse. I've yeah. also noticed that it, it's a separation there between the young Turks and the old established too. Yeah. The younger developers are really more open <coughs> to receiving uh, input from the neighbors and uh, the process. Brandy? I just want to add one of those million studies that got put on a shelf. Uh -huh. Before I got elected, they had the Academy Boulevard Revitalization Committee, mm -hmm. and they actually studied a six-mile stretch of the academy in the southeast part of the city. Yeah, I think John's seen that. Good. Mm -hmm. 
So just want to make sure he was aware of that because that was not my to-do list in two yeah. years, but that's something that would really help that area. frustration that these studies are being done and they're putting on the shelf. Yeah. Well, unless there's someone to rally behind every study, mm -hmm. no one does anything with there. them. They just disappear. Mm -hmm. there, there's another, I ask Kevin if you can remember the name of this process, that engineers are taught, Margaret, maybe you remember, it's a process for coming up with informed consent from the public. And the emphasis is on the informed and to some extent the consent. But there's, it's really not a matter, I'm speaking now as a social scientist, so if you're an engineer, it's forgive okay. me. Um, it's not a matter of really encouraging public discussion as it is a matter of being sure that enough people have been informed so that you can say, we've reached out to all these people, they know, and guess what, they consent. Even though it's only 10 or 12 people who come to each meeting. What, what we're concerned about here at Kono, and Margaret is one of those who made this happen, made this cultural change in, or cultural development in, in Kono, is that we are concerned about really having a robust public process. So that it's not just a matter of sitting, having a bunch of meetings and having a bunch of briefings and being able to say, okay, we've reached out to the entire community and those people who came are okay with this. We want to make sure that that discussion actually helps government understand what's workable from the community's point of view, not just from the specialist point of view, the traffic engineer or the transit engineer or whatever, but rather that it it involves looking at the community holistically, what works politically, socially, economically, etc. And back in the day, there were a few developers oh, who actually came to realize that if they vetted their plans with first with the neighbors of those future developments and then with the broader community, some of us might have ideas they want. And I mean, I can cite chapter and verse in Norwood's development of properties, classics, where ideas that the neighborhood had or residents of the community had that materially improved their development. But they would never have gotten those ideas if it hadn't been for a required public process. And Ralph Braden actually said the same thing yeah. recently. Um, I Once when I was a consultant, Back before I quit working for money, uh, quit working for money, uh, um, had a had a had a Fortune 500 client who, with whom I was really impressed because their their workforce was very diverse, and I said, I'm just amazed. You guys have got all these people from all over the world working for you, and and the guy I worked for worked with primarily, who was head of the company's education and training arm, said, you know, for us, it's a business proposition. The more different people we have around the table, the more likely, likely we are to get to a solution we never would have realized if we had all people from the same cultures. I thought that's a great comment on oh, why, why democracy works. Um, I, I think we've gone really late. Margaret may want Last to say questions. something else. Yeah. I just appreciate your time. And thank you for listening. <laughs> give a plug from our sponsor if you <laughs> please come to our first ever neighborhood neighbor up celebration this friday at ivy wild school we have a couple people here from ivy wild um, this is a way for us to raise some money but it's also a way, raise, way for us to recognize some people and some organizations that have done great things this year and then that's at ivy wild school 5 30 to 7 30 uh, and then saturday is this is something we did about six years ago. It stopped when I became president. <laughs> uh, but we're reinstituting it. And we are having a, a day of workshops and uh, displays. And that will be from 10 to 3 at the Regional Development Building, Regional Development Center over on International Circle. That's open to anyone who wants to come. We have about a little over 50 displays that will be there. We have 12 workshops. You can see more on the website. Yes, Bruce. Can I, afterwards, can I get a photo of you and our two speakers? That'd be great. And then uh, Kathleen Craker at SpreakersGov.com and Bob. Can I put a plug in? If, if you're not a member of Kono, <coughs> Thank you. there are applications on the, the table under that so map in front. We'd love to have you join us as a member. Right. Kono's big deal this year 
is to implement, finally, to, not finally, but to implement, continue to implement our long-range plan, which we developed mostly, still developing, but we get laid the basis for it about a year and a half ago with a large conversation with a lot of people in Kono and in the community. And our two main goals are to grow our human resources and grow our fiscal resources. And uh, we are, I think we're about two months away from hiring our first employees. And we will, and those employees will be concentrated on training neighbor, neighbor leaders. So we think by July, we'll be offering neighbor, neighborhood leadership training programs across the county and the city. So if you contribute to us, you're helping us do that. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. Yeah, there's some way. I've hired a lot of people. Good to hear about this. Oh, thank you. It's a great, great study. Are you in here? I've been in here. And we've 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 been in here